it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Sunrise in Aztlan. Marisol squinted and raised her hand to protect her eyes as the doors to the enclosed trailer rig opened and midday sunlight spilled into the dark interior of the space. They'd been riding for over 18 hours and she and the other women were hot, tired, thirsty and hungry. There was an ice chest with bottled water containers just outside the truck box. She assisted several of the other girls as they climbed out to take a look at the new den of horrors that surely awaited them. Many of the women were barely sane after the months or years they'd been used as sex slaves, transported at irregular intervals, sold or traded among various criminal enterprises. Marisol had been at it for three years, as best she could tell. Her uncle had sold her to a broker, and she'd been told that she'd go to the USA and live with a family while she completed school and would have a promising career waiting for her. Oh, to a 14-year-old with a sketchy education who'd lived a hand-to-mouth existence, anything that amounted to regular food, clothing, and shelter sounding good. And as soon as the broker turned her over to the transporter, the horror began. After days of terror, misery, and pain, as he and his thugs abused her, her mind teetered on the edge of insanity, but she chose to fight back, at least in her soul. Her determination and native wit had allowed her to survive the heinous acts committed upon her body over the last few years. She was taught how to be a proper hostess, and how to please customers and constantly promised that the money she'd made from them would one day purchase her freedom. She'd realized early on that it was a lie, yet a few days passed, her boyfriend, the manager of the cantina where she was forced to ply her trade, told her that she'd finally earned enough. She'd be set free after one last transport and set up with a group of other women to be trained in job skills. Here she was, confused and in strange company. None of the women in the trailer really knew one another. Now a few older women in cotton shifts with tasteful embroidery at the neck and hems shepherded the new arrivals into a plain building, back out of the sun into a cool interior. She hadn't seen much of the outdoors between the truck and the building, just high canyon walls with a spread of greenery and buildings between them. Her grasp of geography was very limited, so she had no idea where she was. The women in the embroidered dresses conducted them up a flight of stairs and into a dormitory. There were twenty women, ten sets of bunk beds and four showers on that floor, but it didn't take terribly long for Marisol and her nineteen companions to get clean and change into very plain, natural cotton shifts. Four of the women in the more ornate dresses led them downstairs to a dining hall, where there was a meal and drink set out for them. The food was plain, but of decent quality, and sufficient quantity to satisfy their needs. They were finally ushered into a break room in the back of the building adjacent to the dining hall. The eldest of their escorts gained their attention and spoke in the upper-class central Mexican dialect of Spanish. We welcome you to our facility. We are here to help you. There is no need for you to work or serve in any way until you are selected for a job. We will interview each of you and help guide you to the best employment. Honourable work for some of you, and, if you like, an honourable match with a working man. Those of you with children will be reunited with them once you are placed. They will receive the best of care until then. You may use any of the recreation facilities in this room, and you are free to roam around anywhere inside. You are forbidden to leave the building unless one of our guides is with you. This city is strange to you, and you will not be safe. So, ladies, relax until we come to get you for your assessment. The next day, when she awakened just after sunrise, Marisol noted that there were now only 19 women in the barracks, including herself. She enjoyed arithmetic and noticed numbers more than did most people. That night, as they prepared to sleep, she counted 18. It gave her an uneasy feeling. Marisol had been very fortunate in that she had no children from whom to be separated. Several of the women were frantic about theirs. Now that she thought about it, the two who were gone had been the most demonstrative and had begged to be allowed to see their babies. By the third day, it was apparent that the group had been losing numbers steadily, two per day by her count. She worked up the nerve to ask one of the women who served their meals and essentially directed their days of leisure what had happened to the missing women. They have moved on to their training programs for new jobs, we screen two of you each day to determine where you'll be placed. Relax, enjoy your time and be calm. We have provided a nice TV, movies, games, and many magazines. 
You are now past all of the grief and sorrows, and will be soon free to make your own life. Well, the words may have been intended to sound comforting, but the woman delivered them as wrote, coldly and efficiently, as she clearly done countless times before she had broken them to Marisol. That afternoon, she finished a shower and dressed in a fresh cotton shift. They had been told to bathe and change every day. It was actually quite refreshing, so she didn't mind. She felt that each shower washed away a little more of her anguish and humiliation. As she left the shower room, she saw one of the hostesses, who silently beckoned her to come downstairs into the front of the building. She did as she was bid. She had been conditioned to do so for the past few years. Once they were downstairs, the woman handed her a nice cool glass of papaya juice, her favourite drink which Marisol downed gratefully. Then the kindly quiet woman beckoned for her to step outside and said softly, It's okay when you're with one of us. She once again had to shield her eyes from the brutal rays of the sun as she left the building, though it was sinking fast toward the horizon. The dawn was well lit, but fluorescent mortal bulbs could not compare to the power of Sol Invictus. She'd heard that name from her village priest when he'd spoken of some ancient people. The woman gently took her by the arm and guided her around the side of the building and into a warren of other similar buildings and structures, all of them at least a few stories tall and set closely together. Marisol remained docile and complied with the older woman's instructions, as her wits dulled and she slipped into a compliant frame of mind. At least until they turned a last corner. She did not balk at continuing, she rather stopped in shock at what lay before her now. Sunlight adjusted eyes and foggy brain. It was a pyramid, with its lower levels built out from the back wall of the box canyon. A step pyramid with four wide levels at exact intervals as the structure rose. At the end of the last passageway between the buildings, they met with a man who escorted another male in simple cotton clothing. The escorts placed Marisol to one side and the wiry young male beside her, and silently indicated that they should walk together toward the pyramid. As they left the final set of buildings and entered the plaza, a man and a woman, each in bright, pre-Columbian native costume, took over the escort duties. The pair of escorts remained absolutely silent as they flanked Marisol and her equally glassy-eyed companion and guided them straight ahead to the foot of the enormous structure. A pair of new escorts awaited and turned to flank her and her companion as the initial two escorts fell behind and took over the vigil at the foot of the structure. At the next major step, where the pyramid broadened, another couple awaited, each was more elaborately festooned with feathers, shells, beads, and metallic decorations, and took over the front position as the previous pair took over their levels, until they reached the foot of the last platform and stood before the stairs that mounted to the apex. They began the final ascent, and she saw that at the top awaited a large, dull block of black stone. On the other side of the altar stood a man. Well, she wasn't sure at first. His costume was so elaborate that it hid his body, and a mask obscured his features. A mask at once ferocious and beautiful. She'd seen the image before, in one of the magazines in the barracks. She hadn't been able to read much of the article that went with it, but this image had graced the cover. One of the other women had told her that it was an image of an ancient Aztec sun and war god, Wade say Pochtli. She stared in awe at the face before her. She'd been feeling strangely calm and detached since she'd finished the papaya juice. She looked on in fascination at the sights below her. A throng of people had silently gathered at the base of the pyramid. They began to chant and then to dance in a slow, rhythmic manner, each one bedecked in bright costume. It was beautiful, with a myriad of colours that swirled and sparkled and further bedazzled her inhibited senses. People were located all around what she now recognised as a central plaza, among a labyrinth of structures carved into the canyon walls or built separately from stone and mud brick. From various points in and around the plaza, musicians joined in the music and drummers pounded out a cacophony. The couple who'd led her up to the last flight of stairs to the altar gently guided her to sit and then lay back supine upon the basalt stone. They guided the young male to lie beside her, but with his head in the opposite direction. They then took positions at either end of the block. Marisol looked on in fascination as the music rose to a crescendo and the man in the exquisite mask stepped up to her and her companion on the altar and forcefully sang what was clearly a prayer. 
He had a beautifully gleaming knife that was made of what looked to her like black glass. Obsidian, she recalled the name from her childhood. That priest who taught her and the other children the little that they knew of the world. Yes, the napstone glittered lovely and bright in the waning sunlight. Kelly's wizened receptionist ushered in the large woman who carried a company-issued go-bag. No company name or logo, just plain shades of grey gear, like an old black-and-white movie. Defense Management and Technology Solutions Incorporated needed no logos, no brands. He would later find that he was truly past being branded as any mention or image of him, and there had been many had been wiped from the internet. It was the first time in a few years that he'd been free of stigma, free to just live as a normal person, well, within reason, of course. Oh, I worked for a super cool international corporation with ties to intelligence communities from all over the world, he thought, as he passed into the manager's office. Kelly was seated at her desk, and two men were seated with her. There was an empty chair dead center in front of her desk, obviously intended for him. Bjorn, right on time. Kelly greeted the latest member of the DMT Solutions field agent team to begin on-the-job slash field training. I'd like you to meet with your team leader for this mission, Art. The burly, dark-hued man who was seated next to her desk stood and shook hands. This other gentleman is your mentor, Silvio. Silvio stood. He was a hare under six feet, lean and wiry, a vulpine predator. His grip was like steel. Though he didn't try any macho BS, he was just strong. Bjorn took his chair and assumed an alert, listening posture. Art and Silvio led their newest team member down to the first level of the corporate office. We'll meet the rest of the team and brief everyone. Braun, you are in training, but you're expected to carry your weight. You should fully participate in the briefing. You heard it firsthand, same as we did. That said... It'd be best to remain silent unless you notice something we forgot, or you have a question or a point to make. Silvio is your mentor, and he'll frog you on the leg or slap you on the back of the head if you start to say something stupid. He winked as he said the last. Silvio grinned up at his young apprentice, a strapping young man with a well-groomed short beard and longish wild hair. He had to look up slightly since the cub was around 6'6". Six, six. Don't worry, Orsetto. I won't hit you hard. <laughs> he laughed in a friendly way, and Bjorn was satisfied he'd properly identified the hint of an accent as Italian. Bjorn remained silent rather than speak, and be confirmed an inexperienced fool. Well, he was hardly loquacious in any case, but he'd worked hard to be good-natured or at least project a non-threatening image, to set aside silly comments that had earlier in his life caused him to become angry, and to put him at risk for an episode. He looked down at his mentor slash field trainer and gave a brief nod. Thanks. Oh, you're going to have to learn to talk and be friendly on this assignment, Cub. Can't have you looking grim all the time. Bjorn gave his broadest, most friendly grin. Uh, better, declared Sylvia, as they reached their destination, room 342. Only a little frightening. Inside was a circular table around which sat four other figures. Art... The team leader entered first, and in his booming voice that matched his burly frame, proclaimed, Ah, uh, new meat. Get up and greet Bjorn, the bear cub. All four figures rose. The first on the right, a twenty-something woman, said simply, Pearly Gates. The second person announced that his name was Jim Bui, super bad regnet hero and purveyor of fine knives, no relation to the Alamo guy. Considering that he was a short, gracile man who appeared to be from Southeast Asia, Bjorn thought his claim may have been made in fun, though he wore an impressive-looking knife at his side. Not as big as the much larger cup sported. It was a veritable short sword, but still, he enjoyed discussing cold steel with fellow aficionados. Next was Daisy. She claimed she was named after a brand of BB gun, but it was in actuality a lethal weapon. The last team member to introduce himself was Young. Medium built and rather handsome, except for a few scars on the left side of his face, and hmm, Bjorn looked on in astonishment. The young man wore a short-sleeved t-shirt, and his complete left arm had clearly been replaced by a prosthetic that was unlike anything he'd ever seen. 
It was cobalt blue, but looked for all the world like a flesh and blood arm. He smiled shyly and said, Jaybird, I do the heavy lifting. He flexed the cobalt arm. I'm part of defense management these days, but I started out on the tech solutions team of DMT Solutions Inc. as a biotech patient. Never thought such a thing would be possible. <sighs> Maybe it's not. It's totally experimental, but amazing. An actual cyborg arm, like I'm in some graphic novel. He trailed off and looked in wonder at his arm, as though it was the first time he'd seen it and learned its capabilities. His smile broadened. I'm happiest to meet you. I'll just finish field training and I'll be glad to have someone new to pick on for a change. Art looked at the young man askance. You don't get to mess with anyone, new dick. Bjorn's here for training. He ain't the newest member of... Uh... He dragged out the last and looked around expectantly, as with a long play game until the entire team roared out as one. Los Diablos Tejanos. Bjorn nodded. The Devil Texian what they called the Texas Rangers during the Mexican War in the late 1840s. Are you all from Texas, or... Art barked out a laugh. <laughs> no, we just talked about cool badass names, and Jim Bowie here suggested it. He's from El Paso, but we let him stay on the team anyway. <laughs> oh, and Jay worked down near Houston, but he's originally from La La Land. There was more light banter, but within a few minutes, Art put on his game face. All right, everybody. Time to settle down for briefing. Next assignment is going to be a challenge. It'll require some undercover work, and our client is Congresswoman Morales via BLM. Our contact there is Newberry. There were groans from a couple in the room. Art cut off the objections. Yeah, get over it. This one's important. Everyone settled down instantly. They were mostly type A personalities, A as in assertive but there were also a well-trained team of professionals. Art began. In a nutshell, people are being trafficked over the border and are disappearing and we don't know what's happening to them. A few days ago, the congresswoman's daughter, Raina, went missing while visiting Galveston. She hasn't shown up at any of her usual haunts. There's been no ransom demand, nor any word for that matter. Of course, the alphabet agencies are working on it. We have some decent intel that links Raina to the other disappearances. So, um, How's this BLM instead of ICE or Homeland? Jim Bui asked. Art nodded in acknowledgement of the good question. Because while we don't know for sure, the trail seemed to lead from the cities into the wilderness out west in the Four Corners region, onto federal land. We'll have to work in some pretty sketchy places. We have to do some things that'll seem pretty callous. But if we can develop or talk to an informant, we can get to the bottom of it. Oh, one thing, he added. The reason they've contacted us is that while law enforcement can file charges, we can actually get the girl as freelancers, and maybe we can find out what's happening with the disappearances and put a stop to it. Bottom line, no one hears from these folks once they pass into Four Corners. We have information that the disappearances are connected to the Atslan movement, apparently not such a dead group after all, and possibly tied to an ancient cult. He raised a hand. Go on, uh, before you ask... I consider at least one of those to be a rumor and the other speculation. However, we've all seen people do some weird stuff. And since weird is what we do... And from there, he gave out assignments and the briefing began in earnest. Shortly before they landed in Houston, Pearly Gates, seated next to Bjorn, asked, You speak any Spanish? Hablo poquito. Comprende más. Bjorn rumbled. Something about Pearly Gates put him off a little. A seething quality, as if she was always on edge. Then it hit him. Like I was before my initial training with Brain. Wonder if she has, um, episodes. He wasn't about to ask at this juncture. They'd made the flight in relative silence, and he was a little surprised when she'd asked him the question. She nodded at his response. Good, we all speak some. Daisy has it as a first language, and it'll be useful on this mission. I'm fluent, so I'm your instructor when we're not doing other work. Silvio's pretty fluent, but he thinks in Italian when he tries to think in Spanish. Comes out weird sometimes. After Art, Silvio's next senior on the team, then me. Now, as you know, DMT Solutions is a meritocracy. Time on and the experience that come with it are valued. But above all, 
performance is the metric that's most valued. The landing process was smooth, easy in a company aircraft to get past any security measures. They picked up vehicles and heavy gear and made their way to their assigned company house. Each had his or her own room in a reasonably nice neighborhood. They also had an apartment in a less savory part of town, near the ship canal, to do any work that required them to give out an address or take in and hold or interrogate any contacts. A neighborhood where no one responded to or called authorities about screams or other loud noises. They met in the dining room and shared a meal in their first on-site planning meeting. Silvio and Bjorn would work the first attempt at renting, leasing, or buying girls. Jay and Jim would try if the first two failed. They didn't expect any real trouble. The transactions were normal for the area around the port. The strangers were not as unusual as in other parts of the city. The information they had indicated that a particular club owner was either directly involved or would likely know who was. From there, it was a matter of following the food chain until they had the transporters they needed. Pearly Gates and Daisy would do the interview work. Art would supervise. If local contacts were needed, he'd develop them and represent the company should the need arise. He was essentially the logistics manager for the mission, and the final arbiter when plans and information had need of reconciliation. Bjorn found a parking space under a light, and spaced a little away from parked vehicles to either side. Silvio looked at him. Why here? Bjorn knew that the question wasn't meant to change his mind or confuse him. Silvio just wanted to gauge his thinking. Well, this SUV is pretty nice. A late model. Potential target for thieves. We're more likely to encounter those than need to have darkness for subterfuge. Plus, we don't know the area. And based on the condition of the parking lot, we don't want to have to flee a darkened space to get our transportation if things go all the way wrong. Plus, we have room to drive away without running into other vehicles or objects. Silvio nodded. Good. What potential problems can you see? Bjorn looked around the lot and at the buildings. Well, first, we can hear the bass of the music thumping even through the closed windows with the air conditioning fan up. It'll be really loud inside, so we'll have to communicate with signals or close contact. Second, there's security staff at the entrance. Shabby, but they're pat searching people for weapons. Not thoroughly, but one has a one style metal detector. Third, that new-looking board fence contains a house or similar structure. A couple just stopped at the gate and spoke to someone inside, who led them through. Not a problem if we hire a girl, but that means we'd have to go through and... Uh, Silvio nodded. Yes, uh, we'd have to use the girls. Maybe not necessary. Depends on who is present tonight. We may be able to just buy some outright. Not likely, though, since they don't know us yet. Keep your role in mind, though. I'm the player, you're the bodyguard. The tough guy. First, we get past security and take a look to see if El Dueno is here tonight. He should be. It's Saturday night. No, Sunday morning. So, he should be if our information is good. They turned on their monitoring equipment and conducted sound checks. The rest of the team was nearby, ready for a rescue if needed. They carefully crossed the parking area, which was full of potholes. He'd observed as he watched the security staff check people that they never reached toward or searched the groin, so they placed their small handguns along the zipper line of their trousers. If the metal detector wand even worked, it was sound in that area anyway. These guys didn't look too interested, just earning their keep. To facilitate the process, Silvio slipped one a $20 bill. With no problemos, they entered La Quetza Cantina and immediately passed a wall with a painted plumed serpent outlined in black light paint. It glowed and gave them a sinister stare. Better artwork than one would have expected in this part of town, Bjorn considered as they entered the club proper. Silvio led them to the bar and ordered a drink. Bjorn stood by him, looking around with menace for any potential threats to his boss. This had the advantage of being part of his true mission, as well as what he needed to project. Several customers took note of the exceptionally large, asute young man, El Oso, but none decided it would be a good idea to bother him or El Zorro, whom he was clearly guarding. The musica thumped on and started to clop as the DJ decided it was time for Jumbia, which he shouted, echoed by many drunken voices in the crowd. 
They made their way to a table, where Silvio sat and leaned back in a relaxed manner, and Bjorn sat and remained upright and clearly on duty. There he was, in plain sight, an older man who wore gaudy jewellery, an ugly white seersucker suit, and a nice fedora with a bright plume that extended from the band on one side, seated on a dice equipped with a long table. His goon stood, one near El Dueno, and one at the opening in the rail around the dais, the gateway to an audience with the great and powerful one. About then a hostess approached Silvio and asked him if he'd like some company. He agreed and she sat in the chair next to him and moved it very close. She said something in his ear and he looked toward Bjorn, made a face and shook his head. Clearly only the boss was worthy of female companionship. The help was, well, helping, doing his job. They spoke back and forth for a few moments and Silvio slipped her a large tip. She got up and approached the bartender. He in turn approached the goon at the rail opening. The goon approached El Dueno, who listened intently and frowned in thought as he looked towards Silvio, who inclined his head respectfully. After a moment, the older man on the dais nodded, and the rail goon waved for Silvio and Bjorn to approach. His Majesty, the owner of this fine establishment. After introductions and pleasantries, they eventually got down to business. Silvio pleaded the case that he was trying to set up again after some unfortunate tangles with other criminals and some thinning of his associates by law enforcement. He needed some girls to get going again. Or maybe he could even lease a few, understanding that they would have to go back to La Cretza's owner or wherever he designated. The big shot agreed to consider the offer and said that he'd let them know by the following Friday. There was plenty to do during the next week while they awaited their next appointment. They researched the players and who'd be most likely to be well, connected with the transporters to nowhere, after taking on a high-risk target like a congresswoman's daughter. Pearly Gates kept her promise and drilled Bjorn every spare moment in Spanish. There wasn't much time to enjoy the nice house before it was time to meet with El Dueno. He had a proper name, but apparently no one had used it since he'd taken over as owner of La Quetza. It's time the real security staff met them and ushered them to the dais. The old man was seated and showed them no courtesies. This time he wore a hideous lime green suit and a light blue beret that once more sported the plume. He looked for all the world like a Mexican leprechaun. It was hard for Bjorn to hold back a smile, at least until the goon from the front entrance and the one who had took charge of the rail entrance began to crowd him. About that time, he saw Silvio tense and raise his chin toward the little man who was clearly so full of self-importance. The gesture was a challenge. Everyone on the dais knew it. Bjorn had let the man get close on either side of and a little behind him. He fainted forward, as if intending to attack their jefe, but abruptly stopped as the two large men surged forward and grabbed at his arms. He stepped back and used his elbows to strike them both in the solar plexus. He turned into the one on the right as he delivered a hammer fist to his jaw, then continued his turn, stepped forward, and used his elbow to strike the other in the jaw. He kept turning in another full spin and stomped a foot on each of them and then turned, planted his feet, and pushed both to flip backwards over the rails. The personal guard stepped forward as his compatriots hit the floor, and Bjorn pivoted and grabbed the man's gun hand in his own massive paw and crushing grip. He used a palm heel strike and slammed into the goon's chin, and then a second strike shattered his nose. Before the man could crumple in place, Bjorn stepped back and used the grip on his now limp and empty gun hand to whip him around and over the rail to land heavily on top of his two associates. As his first line of defense fell and his personal guard engaged with Bjorn, the owner of the club started to rise, but Silvio was on him. He saw that the little man had a large pistol, which he was in the process of drawing from under the table. He pointed it toward Bjorn, the obvious threat, but Silvio took hold of his gun arm and raised it, even as he fired. The explosion from the barrel was barely audible under the eardrum-punishing thumping of the music, but the long flash from the barrel was very clear to anyone who dared gaze at the occupants of the dais. Silvio kept twisting the little man's arm and then used his own palm strike to break the man's elbow. El Dueno pissed himself, and all but collapsed. Silvio, however, had a new plan for the little king of turds and owner of shite. Bjorn shook slightly. His blood was up, and he feared that an episode was about to take him, 
but he managed to remain focused on the task at hand. They had surprisingly little trouble getting out of the cantina in the parking lot. He drove them to the designated rendezvous point at an abandoned industrial building near the port. They met with the rest of the team and the arrogant little man, who was king in his own world but nowhere else, told them everything he could. It didn't take much persuasion. He was in tremendous pain and when the woman pointed at the wetness in the front of his pants and pretended to laugh, he was completely humiliated. In the end, he set them up with a contact. He indeed knew the transporters who took care of girls, who were used up or who caused problems, and who maybe had been looking for a special treat to kidnap. They took him to the crappy apartment and set up a watch on him until they'd confirmed his information was accurate. And then they tied up his loose end. Silvio led Bjorn through the process of flushing a now useless turd into the Gulf of Mexico. His information was confirmed, so there was no need for him, and he'd been likely to want revenge, or worse yet, pass on intel to his superiors. Bjorn turned to his mentor once the body had properly sunken. So, uh, do we do things this way often? Silvio looked up, a little surprised. Well, no, but this piece of crap tried to shoot you. Don't tell me you have sympathy for it. Bjorn shook his head. No, I just wondered about the frequency of the necessity. Silvio shrugged. Depends on the assignment and on the targets. Doesn't happen most assignments. Well, at least not collateral damage or intelligence sources. When we take out a piece, the other bricks have to shift. Bjorn nodded and passed the bottle of hand sanitizer he just used to his trainer. Yeah, that's what I thought. By the way, I never thanked you. You saved my life when you pulled that big pistol. Silvio waved him off as he took his turn to clean his hands. All in a day's work, brother. Besides, if he'd used something more practical and without a safety, he'd have been just a hair faster. I'd need a new trainee and Art would be unhappy with me for losing the one I had. They shared a grin and made their way back to the big house to regroup with Los Diablos Tejanos. We have eyes on him, Daisy's voice intoned over the earbud. Just like the man in the wet green pants told us. Handlers, truck, lead and drag cars. Driver and partner just loaded the last of the cargo, and they're shipping out west. She and Jay were on overwatch with the target. The other two vehicles would follow on as backup in case there were any problems. Their biggest concern was that they had bad information and that these girls would ship no further than San Antonio, Austin, or El Paso, yet they'd have to chance the long drive. There was indeed a stop in San Antonio, but only to add some more women to the convoy of misery that once again wended its way westward. In El Paso, they dropped off a few and added a few. The drive to El Paso had been the longest and most desolate of Bjorn's young life, through the empty lands west of the Pejos. Then they headed into New Mexico and turned northwards. The convoy made another stop in Albuquerque. This time they dropped off a few of their unwitting passengers, but didn't pick up any new ones. Then it was north again, into the Navajo Reservation lands. It was Daisy's turn to drive as the sun sank to their left. Jay took a turn to rest and snooze in the passenger seat, the long sleeve shirt he perpetually wore in public removed and folded neatly on his lap. The new arm didn't react much to temperature changes, but his natural one was hot inside the sleeve, so he'd opted for comfort. Daisy glanced at the biotech marvel and wondered how real it felt to the young man. He'd been some kind of police officer before, and served in the armed forces before that. From what he'd told them, a mutated feral hog had taken off his arm and scarred his features. He shouldn't have survived, but he'd managed to fight his way through the critical exsanguination and cling to life, in a coma for weeks. Pretty amazing stuff. He'd survived Iraq without a scratch, only to get wrecked while working as a campus cop. A pig nearly eaten by a pig, she chuckled to herself. She had to slow as the convoy turned into a truck stop to refuel. She drove past them and used the car entrance. She notified the rest of her own convoy, and about a mile behind her, they were making a pit stop. She nudged her companion. Jaybird, wakey wakey, we're making a refuel stop. He looked up blearily, checked their surroundings, then his phone. Kind of soon, don't you think? They just filled up when we made the turn at Albuquerque. Daisy realized that they had indeed made a fairly recent stop. Oh, maybe there's mechanical trouble, she reasoned. 
Maybe one of them needed to take a deuce. Jay offered. Nasty. She poked him in his special arm. It flexed like any mundane arm, but looked so weird to her with that bright shade of blue. Maybe we should call you Blue Jay. She pulled up on the other side of the store building and tried to keep an eye on the big rig, which was pulled up next to the truck fueling station. She saw one of the other cars parked near the front entrance of the store where two men had gotten out and begun to stretch. One of them yawned. Where's the other car? she asked herself. Hey, Chica, why don't you turn off your engine and step out here for a little talk? You want to know what we're doing, where we're going, eh? Daisy looked over her left shoulder. Dang, she admonished internally. Classic trap. Watch one too intently and the other gets the drop on you. This one indeed had the drop on her, his pistol already in hand and pointed in her direction. Jay dropped his seat back as he drew his own pistol to fire through the back driver's side window at the top. His move startled the other gangster, who had slithered up to the passenger side of the car. Jay's pistol was equipped with a sound suppressor, so the noise was bearable, and the shattering of the window glass was not intense. He'd taken out the thug who'd threatened Daisy, who now started to draw her own weapon, when the man behind Jay fired through the open passenger side front window and struck Jay's left leg, just above the knee. His next two rounds struck the center console and dash in turn. They were not silenced, and the roar set Daisy's head and ears ringing as she came online and pressed her trigger. The back passenger side window shattered, and glass spiraled in every direction as her rounds hit him in the left side of his pelvis at the femoral artery. He was out of commission, and would soon bleed out and die. Daisy turned to Jay. We're getting out of here. Hang tight. Put pressure on that wound. She threw the car in gear and started to back out of the space when the windshield burst inward and several rounds passed between them. Two more struck the seat next to Jay's left shoulder. He was too focused on the agony in his knee to notice. Daisy put the car back in park. The second convoy car had pulled in behind them and the occupants had exited and circled to the front of her car. They were trapped. When Silvio and Bjorn turned into the lot... It took them a moment to locate the car with Daisy and Jay. Art, Pearly Gates and Jim turned into the trucker's entrance and searched the other side of the building. Silvio slowed the car and parked it as though they were customers getting fuel. Both men could see two thugs that loaded Daisy into their trailer of the big rig. They couldn't see Jay. The thugs piled their two dead friends, one of them still in the process of dying, into the trunk of the car that was parked behind Daisy and Jay. One hopped into that one, and the other ran to the car that the two dead gangsters had been driving. The entire convoy left the lot, and again headed north. Art exited the store, gun in hand but down at the side of his leg. He stopped to check on Jay. He looked up as Silvio and Bjorn approached from one side, and Pearly Gates and Jim from the other. He looked at Jim. Get a tourniquet or whatever is needed on Jay. You and Pearly Gates get him out of here and contact a cover team to meet you at the hospital. Albuquerque's the closest. He looked at Silvio and Bjorn. You two, back in the car. We're now the solo trail vehicle. Pearly Gates objected. Boss, Jim can take care of the medical issue. You may need me. Mart shook his head, already making to move toward the car where Silvio and Bjorn had already plopped into their seats. Still got clean up on Daisy's car and potential witnesses. I know she's your friend, but we can't let this get out of hand. There's still a chance we can get back on their tails and find the final destination. Go help Jim. That's where you're needed most. We'll get Daisy. If there's time and we can all regroup, we will. They sped down the road for a few miles before Art admonished Silvio to slow some. They didn't want to blast past the slavers. His big fear was that they'd stop in some out-of-the-way location to question Daisy. They'd likely assume she was law enforcement, maybe Border Patrol or ICE, but they'd want to make sure. She could even be from a rival outfit. Criminals needed information and intelligence as much as the good guys did. It was another hour before they spied the trail car. They'd almost decided to backtrack and look for signs that the rig had turned off the highway, though that was unlikely. Apparently they decided to keep going until the next regular stop. The surrounding darkness didn't actually help, since the necessity of using headlights ensured that their car would be noticed if the bandits looked behind. 
Mark reasoned that they'd be more likely to be looking out for red and blue lights since they'd just fled a loud shootout and had bodies tucked in the trunk of one of their cars. They made it up to a small town and turned northwest towards the Four Corners region. Before they reached the state line junctions, the taillight shifted and the convoy turned into a rest stop. This was where it all get dangerous. Silvio put his turn signal on and turned into the rest stop. He and Bjorn exited the car and entered the restroom. Art stayed and kept an eye on the tractor trailer and its escorts. There was an old white short bus stopped beside the truck. The windows were darkened, but presently the back door opened and several girls were ushered from the bus into the dark trailer. Art used his mini binoculars to check the logo on the side of the bus. It was from a local reservation. These girls were most likely native girls, Americans being sold to the slavers. Art took over driving for a while since he was most rested. Due to Bjorn's bulk, Silvio took the back seat. They left out ahead of the convoy, but just ahead. They travelled just below the speed limit, and before long the lead car overtook them. When they reached a two-lane passing area, Art pulled to the right lane and let them pass. He stayed behind them and just spared up for occasional glimpses. He'd have to get closer soon. They were nearing the area where their intel said that the convoys disappeared, and it'd be daylight in a couple of hours. They'd been climbing for some time, and off to the side of their car, Bjorn and Silvio looked out at the moonlight above the messes. It was a stirring sight, and each man sank into his own thoughts. At last, the convoy turned onto a plain dirt track. There were no markings or signs, but it was well maintained. Art turned off the headlights and followed by moonlight and the red taillights in the distance. They wound through several of the mesas and low hills, and then turned onto a downward track that led into a canyon. Art pulled into some mesquite brush on the right and turned off the engine. What's the idea, boss? We may lose them, Silvio opined from the back seat. We can track them. Art said confidently. There's nowhere else to go. Down into the canyon. There must be a settlement or something down there. Weird, but hey, weird's our specialty. It's a one-lane dirt road. If we go too far, we'll have to stop behind them. If they drop off and do a turnaround, we'll be trapped. Now, how about we unask the car, get our lights and vision gear, some ropes, and take a shortcut down the canyon wall. Save us some time walking down that dirt road, which may come under unfriendly observation at any time, and hopefully they don't have much farther to go. They made it to the canyon floor and paralleled the track for a few miles. There was an odd rhythmic sound from up ahead, as though drums and many voices rose in a chant. They looked at one another uneasily. The sound drifted in the dry desert air, then abruptly ceased, started again for a moment, then stopped for good. They could see that dawn had arrived above the canyon rim, but the shadows prevailed. Up ahead, the road simply ended at a wall, where the wide split in the land became a box canyon. The vehicle tracks led straight up to it and vanished. Silvio led the others to a pile of rocks from which they observed, hopefully without being observed in turn. This will do for now, until we can figure out their security system and who may be watching. I'd like to take a look at the box and wall, rumbled Bjorn. I can stay close to it and remain in the shadows. They should last a while longer. He continued speaking before either of the elder men could raise an objection. I know, I'm massive. However, I can move as well as anyone. In this outdoor space, the scale makes me as puny as either as you. Besides, I need to do something useful. I'm training, right? Art nodded and Silvio patted his charge lightly on the shoulder. You have your spada, Berkab, to which Bjorn smiled in a manner that made it evident how he'd earned the sobriquet there, as he patted the two-foot-long blade sheathed at his hip. Before any more conversation, the young giant was off among the rocks and sidling up to the wall. Once he was there, he blended into the surroundings surprisingly well. Had the two senior members of the team not known he was there, they could easily have missed him. Your trainee is well prepared in the defense management school. He moves well. I hear that Ed herself recruited him. Silvio beamed a feral grin at his team leader. He's green, but surprisingly capable. He has no idea, of course, 
Why worry for the day that he realizes what a rare combinations of talents he has? He'll want to take over the outfit. Art glanced at where he thought Bjorn should be and then looked back at Silvio. Oh, maybe he should. I've lost him. Silvio chuckled. I kept talking because I hoped you had eyes on him. I lost him before you first spoke. Oh, wait. Yes, there he is. Looks like he's on the way back to us. Presently, Bjorn slipped onto his belly beside his bosses. Mystery solved. You'll be able to tell when it gets light, but that wall's just a camouflage rolling gate. Works well here, since the canyon narrows and the area stays in the shade most of the day. I couldn't really see inside, but I heard some people talking and smelled cigarette smoke. Definitely guards on duty on the other side. I counted only two voices, but there are likely more nearby. Oh, we'll need a full unit to take it straight on. Not really what we want to do until we have enough information to solve the mystery. Art replied to Bjorn's report. Guess we'll be climbing the wall again, then backtracking along the wall topside. Silvio and Bjorn nodded ruefully, and the men began the climb and backtrack. Daisy settled in among the other women in the back of the truck. She heard the locks engage on the outside. Nothing to do but get acquainted on the journey ahead. She waited for her eyes to adjust to the gloom. Some light leaked in from the doors, and there were small screens around the walls of the trailer that allowed some air and light to penetrate. Unlikely to suffocate, she thought, but still pretty murky, dark outside. She looked around her, but all of the women, mostly girls, sat with their faces down, hair drooping, and were clearly wrapped in miserable thoughts. She considered her own position. She wasn't overly worried, and she trusted her team, how talented they were, even though this gang had gotten the jump on her and Jaybird. Oh, I hope he's okay, poor guy, she winced when she thought of how it must have hurt him when the bullet entered his leg. It looked bad, top of the knee. Well, She shook off those thoughts, unproductive. The men had questioned her briefly about anyone else following them. She'd insisted that she and Jay were not following them on purpose, but had intended to rob the truck stop since cops were thin on the ground this way. Well, they'd been dubious, but she was a decent enough actress and pointed out that she and Jay were both armed and had done some damage. It helped that she carried no ID and their vehicle had been pretty standard. She once more let her eyes roam around the trailer rig. There, that one in the front corner nearest her cab. Her gaze was fixed but angry rather than hopeless. Her clothes were nicer than anyone else's, including Daisy's. Yeah, it was her. Daisy recognized her from the file photo. This was Reina Marquez Morales. No fucking way. Well, she knew that the odds were astronomical. Then again, the truck slightly didn't roll that often. Reina had probably been held elsewhere for a while to let the initial buzz settle. It really hadn't been that long since she'd gone missing, just over a couple of weeks, and here she was in a tractor trailer, shoved in amongst the regular girls like so much cattle. For that matter, so was Daisy. She wanted desperately to talk to the girl, but feared that some of the others might be snitches. She cleared her throat. Anyone here speak English? She tried to sound hopeful. Her Spanish was native and excellent, but they didn't need to know that. Crickets. Apparently no one did. Only a few even bothered to look up at her. Raina just continued to glare at a spot on the opposite wall. Oh, great. Guess this is going to be a boring trip. She let a little defiance creep into her voice. I speak English, but I don't want to talk right now. Maybe later. At the moment I'm tired and angry and want to use a real toilet, not that bucket in the corner. Raina said as she flicked her chin to the opposite corner where there was a five-gallon bucket with a toilet seat and cover mounted in a corner. Well, Daisy had simply assumed that the reek of the place was produced by pentin humans, but the honey bucket definitely added to the effluvium. Thanks, Daisy nodded. Can't blame you. When you're ready. Moctezuma placed his feathered cloak on the peg in his chamber. Servants did most things for him, but only he touched the sacred garments and accoutrements. He eagerly awaited the arrival of the special ones, the pair that would be sacrificed on the day of return. It was when Quetzalcoatl would return in fury and lead the people to reclaim this land. 
On the last return, he was embodied in the Cortez, a conqueror with a similar appearance and name to that what was in the old prophecy. The priest king knew, based on later prophecy, that this time the Quetza would lead beside Moctezuma. He'd only recently found the right bride for the son, but he'd known the groom for years, the eldest son of one of the most powerful cartel bosses. The girl would be a good match for him, both the children of the ruling class from within the light and dark of society. The boy's father had willingly offered him. He had plenty of other sons, and this one did not show much promise as a criminal mastermind. The usual offerings, offerings not sacrifices, were the discarded souls of the world who sought dreams of freedom and prosperity, but whose bodies were instead used by cruel masters. Women shattered by the sex trade, men exhausted by work in fields and processing plants, mere peasants, those offerings. Yet these two children of powerful people would be a true sacrifice, something special for the people, la raza, to offer the gods as a means to gain their favour and to welcome the coming of Quetzalcatl. So he had been taught as he grew into the role of the priest-king of his people. It had become more difficult of late to hide from the modern governments and drones and satellites. He had had to allow a modern technology to blend with the ancient ways. Yet that would soon all be done. The bride had arrived just in time. There were no ill portents as had preceded the arrival of Cortez. This time there would be triumph and the gods would return to claim this land for their people. Once they were up top and back at the car, the truncated DMTS team took a little more time to thoroughly hide the vehicle. The main concern was that the guys would have aerial surveillance, likely drones. They retrieved more gear and drank plenty of water. The dry air drained the moisture from their bodies with even slight exertion. Art contacted Pearly Gates on his closed channel sat phone. Oh, looks like Jay's going to make it, but he may end up with a new leg to match his arm. Kid'll be a bionic man before it's all done. We'll have to start calling him Blue Jay with all that cobalt blue hide. Uh, she took care of cleaning the truck at the stop, and a few potential witnesses were all well paid and frightened enough to have seen and heard nothing. Local Ellie has been redirected. All surveillance video for the date in question has been, well, mysteriously looped. She was able to capture our coordinates. Of course, she and Jim Bowie want to join us now that Jay's stable. They'll contact us when they reach the turn-off to the dirt road. Bjorn pointed back along the roadway they'd followed. Dirt on top, but you can see it's paved underneath the sand and gravel. No wonder it was in good shape. Asphalt underlayment. Silvio nodded. Well, good eye, Bjorn. Now, let us find a place to bed down until we get the rest of our team. Bjorn did just that, and they were soon ensconced among some rocks near the canyon rim place from which they would watch without being observed and rest in preparation for a busy night. Toward evening, Jim and Pearly Gates arrived and soon had their new SUV hidden near the car. The entire group prepared to set out once full dark had arrived. Any word on Daisy? Pearly Gates asked anxiously. Art shook his head. No, Pearly Gates. We haven't seen the occupants of the truck and it hasn't left the canyon yet. As the sun sank until it met with the western horizon, they heard, very faintly this time, a rhythmic thumping and chants as the canyon acted like an enormous speaker and piped the sounds to them. Not many other people would have noticed, but DMT Solutions teams were trained to do so, and most of this team had experiences that led them to notice far more than was common. Then the noises were drowned out by the yips and wails of nearby coyotes, plaintively calling into the coming night. It was time to go. They were unsure of what had happened to the people who disappeared into the canyon, but they knew that Daisy was in grave danger. As a trainee, Bjorn had known her the least amount of time, but he had learned to like and respect the young woman. She appeared small and soft, but could pack a wallop when the need arose, and had the energy of a BB in a glass bowl, as she proudly claimed on more than one occasion. He could clearly see that Pearly Gates was the most affected. She and Daisy were like sisters. Pearly Gates had taken on a cold, seething anger, and he could see the struggle within her to maintain a calm approach. They desperately needed information on the interior of the facility and how it operated. He and Pearly Gates now peered over the rim of the canyon wall through advanced night vision devices. 
the technical team of DMTS had produced many near miracle tech devices, and these were no exception. The canyon opened up dramatically after the choke point. The buildings along the sides were cleverly worked into the natural rock for the most part, but the city, well, there was no other word for it, extended onto the canyon floor as well. As the wall of the actual end of the box canyon rose, a pyramid. A real-life pyramid right there in the good old USA, he mused. Oh, even if half of those buildings are dwellings, we're looking at a population of around five to ten thousand. More if the caves extend deeply into the surrounding rock, he rumbled to his fellow scout. Hmm. Pearly Gates growled in return, possibly in agreement, but probably with some reservations. Her tawny locks gleamed a silver grey in the moonlight, for all the world like a puma. He was reminded of those creatures when her eyes flashed in his direction. We aren't going to get any more information from here. Let's go back and see what the drones found and the satellite mapped. They returned to the makeshift camp inside the boulders. Silvio, in his vulpine manner, suddenly appeared from the darkness. It was almost enough to startle Bjorn. Never a good idea, even though he'd been trained to control himself. Pearly Gates, already on edge, snapped at the lean field agent. Seriously? You should know better, Silvio. Never jump out in front of fellow predators unless you're looking for a fight. Silvio nodded tightly in acknowledgement. Yes, you know it works both ways, though. The two of you are moving very quietly. No need to startle the rest of the Diablos Tejanos. We are all on edge with worry over Daisy. I've downloaded the sat information to your devices. Art and Jim Bui are bringing in the drones and we can start sorting out our plans. So I don't know much more than you. Raina spoke quietly to Daisy, who had moved to sit beside her, despite the proximity of the rank honey bucket. I was in Galveston with some friends. We have a beach house there at Jamaica Beach. A couple of girls I didn't know came in with a friend. I think they must have played a part in taking me. We hung out and partied for a while, then <laughs> I woke up in a dark room. They turned on a red light bulb and they fed me. I was able to figure out where the toilet sink combination and the cot were. Everything was metal. I couldn't really see the person, or well, maybe people who brought the meals, but I think they were all women. Maybe like these. She waved her hand slightly to indicate their fellow passengers on the journey to misery. Daisy nodded along, but remained silent. She wanted the girl to keep talking. After a moment, Raina obliged. Then they came for me, the goons, the ones that put you in here with us. Neither one of us belongs here. The rest of the women are undocumented. I talked to a few, mostly prostitutes. She whispered the last. I can't believe this. Do you know who my mother is? Has there been anything on the news? Daisy wasn't ready to show her hand yet. No idea. Don't watch the news. Boring. Well, I've seen some things, though. These chicks don't look like pros. They look like sheep. Sheep that have been kicked around pretty hard. Raina shrugged. Whatever, I just hope that my friends were able to get help. If my mum finds out, she'll send someone to get me. She again slipped into a whisper. She's in Congress. They'll have to send someone. She's pretty well known. Even some talk of her being in line for a bigger office. I just have to wait. Daisy again remained silent. Apparently the girl was spoiled and vacuous enough to assume that none of the other women would note or comprehend her whispers. She had to do her job, but, God, what an arrogant little arsetard. Definitely had to keep that to herself. Raina had seemed to hold it together pretty well, but now she sniveled a little. A small whimper and sniff of soft crying. Someone in this trailer seemed to be crying quietly at all times, like they took it in shifts. The truck slowed considerably and made one sharp turn, then headed down a steep grade. Eventually it leveled out for a while, and then it stopped. There were rumbles and voices outside, and the truck once again lurched forward. The poor light that penetrated the vents began to turn grey when the truck came to what felt like a significant halt. The driver took the vehicle out of gear, and she heard the cab doors open and shut. Presently, the first bright light of the morning greeted her. It wasn't too bad. There were still shadows since... <gasps> Canyon walls. That's what secluded the light. 
The herd of women left the truck, and women in plain cotton shifts with intricate embroidery met them and spoke soothingly as they were ushered into a plain building that Daisy quickly recognised as a dormitory. Like in a jail, but maybe a little nicer. A newer jail. While one of the elder women gave a short introduction, she focused on a different discussion that occurred just outside the still-open door. She noted that one of the eldest of the women spoke to the lead thug. That was close. We only have one left. The one for sunset tonight. Tomorrow is the big day, but we still have to keep up the circle of the sun. This won't be the last load. The thug shrugged. Oh, the big M's the one who ordered us to time it this way. We kept her close to where we took her until the immediate search was over. Oh, she's feisty but empty-headed. Still, we can't put her off for too long with stories about Ransom. Oh, there's another one. Oh, she'd be good for sunset today or tomorrow. Yeah, she caused us some trouble. Might as well take care of it. Come on, young one. We're going inside to look at the rest of the dormitory. One of the women in the embroidered shift smiled at Daisy and indicated with her hand that she should move along. Daisy saw that the smile did not touch her eyes. They were black and hard, like obsidian. It had been relatively easy to access the city from the canyon walls, but the team then had to figure out how to move about without getting caught, and then how to find Daisy and possibly Raina among thousands of other people. They weren't even completely sure that Reyna would be in the city. She could be anywhere on the trail of misery that they'd followed. Still, she was their primary mission. Art had stayed above, their communication link with a cleaner team on standby. That group would take care of any unfortunate messes, to include avenging their death should such a need arise. they decided to start with the pyramid. There was nothing else like it. Surely it was the centre of whatever was happening in this place. The moon rose above the canyon wall and shed some light, but there was very little visible artificial lighting. It was likely that the community cooperated in keeping the location off the maps. The central plaza appeared deserted, and the pyramid rose ahead in the gloom, massive and tall, but wide enough at each level to still appear somewhat squat. The lowest level extended into the canyon wall. The second level appeared to be flush with it. The rest descended in smaller platforms until at the top, a large basalt rock rested free and clear of everything but its enormous base, the pyramid. It was set so the bottom of it was just above the rim of the canyon, high in the sky and in position to greet the rising sun and bid farewell as it set. Bjorn and Silvio took a position near one of the structures from which no sounds of occupation emanated. Pearly Gates and Jim Bui tackled the climb from one of the sides. There were no deliberate steps on the south face, only the east and west faces, but the surface was fairly rough and there were carvings and protrusions that, in combination with the gentle slope, made the climb easy for their levels of experience. They made the ascent in under ten minutes. Bjorn watched as the scouts sunk low at the apex to avoid being silhouetted against the night sky with its bright moon and myriad of stars, all made clear by the absence of humidity. Had he not known they were there, he wouldn't have seen the few tiny signs that they displayed. He was starting to get nervous, and noted that Silvio squirmed as well. Then a shadow rose from the silvery light. It was quickly joined by another. The scouts had returned. Pearly Gates spoke in low tones. That thing is just what it looks like, an altar. It's been cleaned, but there are clear signs that blood has flowed across the surface of that block. It went into a drain in the centre. The back of the block that faces the cliff has an opening, like a chute. Ugh, it seriously reeks. Flashlight beam couldn't find the bottom, but there's definitely airflow, like the entire pyramid is breathing. Very dramatic. There's a narrow stair that leads up and down the north face from the top of the second level. A door leads into the canyon wall. Apparently anyone who needs to magically appear can simply ascend that stair and voila. The whole view from the top looks like this is a theatre stage. Jim Bui watched their trail and remained vigilant during the report and only added, There's a stench of death in that place. The basal block had two slight indentations, so two human bodies could be placed side by side with heads in opposite directions. <sighs> kind of creepy, like some old pulp story, Tarzan or Conan, maybe Cthulhu, but with actual people dead at the end of the ceremonies. 
Maybe they needed so many people to fill up the pyramid with bodies. Who knows? He shivered a little. Jim Bui was tough, but the situation had him on edge. Pearly gates remain cold. We don't know where Daisy is or Raina. Should we look around the buildings? There's just no way to tell when or even if they might be brought to this place. In the end, they decided to take a look around the city. Pearly Gates and Jim Bui started at the base of the eastern stairs and Bjorn and Silvio took the western end. The streets were squared off because of the buildings that lined them, yet it seemed that the buildings were staggered so that there were no direct approaches to the pyramid until one cleared the last offset. Then it was a short walk into the plaza and to the base of the steps. They maintained a leisurely pace, stalking quietly and staying close to walls that cast moon and shadows when possible. The night was moving on rapidly and it was eerie how quiet the complex was when they considered the number of people they'd observed and heard earlier. Every roof and upper wall was left in natural basic colours, but each lower level had been used as a canvas for murals of ancient native life and depictions of the myths and legends of pre-Columbian tribes in their glory days. It was difficult for Bjorn to avoid becoming engrossed in the tales that the artwork told, but then he saw one that he could not ignore. He touched Silvio's shoulder, and then tapped it and pointed to the pertinent wall. It displayed the same feathered serpent or dragon figure that they'd observed at La Crizza Cantina. It appeared to fly above and preside over a pyramid. On the pyramid were figures. A brightly bedecked one stood above two others, very obviously male and female characters. The colourful person held a long, black object above them. It looked like a large knife that he intended to plunge into the chests of the supine figures on the dull, black altar. There were two other figures in ornate dress, another male and female, who stood by with basins to catch the blood that would surely flow. Bjorn and Silvio looked at one another briefly, then Silvio indicated with a nod and hand gesture that they should keep going. Yet at the end of the building, they had to halt. They had reached the parking area, across which was a large garage shed that contained the tractor trailer and escort vehicles that they would followed. Two men stood beside them, visible only because one was smoking. When the breeze shifted, Bjorn could make out brief snatches of conversation, but nothing intelligible. Silvio signalled that he should wait, and then he ducked around the corner to the front of the two-story structure. He returned presently and signalled for Bjorn to follow him. They reached the back of the building and rounded the corner together once more. They reached the back of the building and rounded the corner together, and once more two figures emerged from the gloom of the night. Pearly Gates and Jim Wee. Daisy quietly scouted through the dormitory in search of an escape route, other than the front door back doors on the first floor. She found none. There were no windows in the structure, not even in the dorm monitor suite. The door at the top of the stairs had been locked, but she worked for a company that focused on solutions. She heard light snoring from the two figures that were there as guides and guards. She crept past their open door and tried the back door. Locked. Looking at it, she decided that she could open it. But first she checked for alarms. None. The typical captives were cowed before they even arrived, and security had clearly grown lax. She exited and was pleased to find a bright glowing moon above to greet her. She glanced around and saw a figure disappear around a corner. Odd. The rest of the complex was as quiet as a grave. Might as well follow. She figured she had about an hour to explore. Bjorn felt a heavy tap on his shoulder and smoothly flowed into a kneeling posture as he came to a stop. He looked around first with his eyes, then slowly he turned his head. Silvio was ahead of him and Jim Bui was just behind. Pearly Gates was the rear guard. She was faced in the direction from which they come, and based on her stance she was prepared for a fight. Jim Bui had his heavy knife in hand and Bjorn realised that he'd instinctively drawn his own oversized Scramatix without conscious thought. He'd passed on the signal to Silvio, who was now stood watch at the next corner, in the shadows. There was the slightest glint of the sharp edges of his stiletto. He couldn't see it, but he knew that Pearly Gates would have held her pistol with the sound suppressor. They were completely prepared for an attack. He wondered if the men who'd been out with the trucks had spotted them and followed. Pearly Gates quickly stood and stepped forward toward their stalker. 
Bjorn's first instinct was to rise and assist her against the opponent who grappled with her. Then he realized that their shadow was none other than Daisy, and the grapple was a warm embrace. The team continued their silent trek until they were near the plaza. They gathered around in a pool of shadows and spoke in sotto voce tones to make their plans. Daisy insisted on going back to the dormitory. I have to protect Raina. I don't know when they'll take her, but if we're the sacrifices, we have to let it go forward until we can figure out a rescue for all of the captives. For that matter, they may take me first. I am a problem child. She gave a wicked grin with that. Pearly Gates slipped a small caliber pistol into Daisy's palm. Now you're a problema for these freaks. And her grin was downright savage. Bjorn presented her with one of his smaller blades. So, what's the plan? Daisy made it to the bottom of the stairwell before she heard anyone stir on the first floor. She was at the top before the matrons reached the bottom, and in her bunk well before they reached the top of the stairs. One of them crept over and quietly awakened Raina, who naturally whined at this early hour. I don't care about getting a tour of the facilities, and you know very well that I don't need a job screening. I want sleep. I'm tired, and for the first time in days I'm clean and in a decent enough bed. The matron shushed her and reassured her that it was important that she rise and follow her downstairs. With a groan, Raina rose and put on her issued sandals. She shuffled across the dorm room, dragging and scuffing her feet the entire way. Daisy was tempted just to let her die. What a useless brat, she thought briefly and unrealistically. But even this idiot didn't deserve to have her still beating heart cut from her chest. Maybe, she thought as she rose silently and ghosted after the receding pair. Bjorn and Silvio took position on the north side of the pyramid, just below the rim of the second platform. They settled on the west side since it would be the most in shadow during sunrise. They decided, and Art had agreed, that regardless of who was sacrificed, they would have to focus on Raina. She was the mission. Pearly Gates and Jim Bui had taken position so that Daisy, who now knew her way to the plaza, could inform them which captive was on the way to the sacrifice. They would relay the information to Pearly Gates, who would climb up to assist Bjorn and Silvio, while Jim Bui had remained to assist Daisy when the need arose, as they were sure it would. Daisy saw the shadow within the shadow where Jim Bui stood, paused and waiting. How does he stand so still? she wondered. It's Raina. I stepped out while they had her drink some juice and gave her a small breakfast. She was grumpy, but those old bats will get her moving soon. Jim Bui tried to send a text on his sat phone. Great, this thing's not getting a signal. So much for DMTS Supertech. Como hasn't worked right since we got to the floor of the canyon, he mumbled. Daisy assumed Jim Bui's post while he ran across the plaza to let Pearly Gates know what was happening. He'd almost made it across when a large figure loomed in front of him. The figure appeared even larger due to the feathers and decorations that festooned his head and frame. He uttered what was clearly a challenge in a language that Jim Bui did not understand. He was fluent in English, Vietnamese, and Spanish. And he had no idea what the mess of consonants with skips and implied apostrophes meant. Instead of trying to answer, he merely pointed beyond the man towards the shadows at the base of the pyramid. The man took the bait, like a nerd who assumed that the bully was sincere when he pointed out that his shoelaces were untied. The man looked over his shoulder and as he turned back angrily towards Jim Bui to castigate him for his foolishness, he found that he could not speak. He could not inhale a new breath, and his lower chest was on fire and in tremendous pain. Then he felt a tug in the same place, and hot liquid spilled down his abdomen toward his groin. His knees went weak, and he sunk onto them. From there, Jim Bui grasped him under the arms and began to drag him toward the shadows where pearly gates awaited. Jim Bui greeted Pearly Gates. Definitely Raina. She should be on the way shortly. See, the sky above the canyon wall is turning rosy and the shadows of people are shuffling this way. I hope that this guy isn't part of the ceremony. Could you have just used some funk jitsu to knock him out or something? 
We can't leave him laying around like he had a case of natural causes. Oh, this will stir up the hornet's nest. Jim Bui shrugged. Ah, typical racist bullshit about all Asian people knowing martial arts. Well, I do, but you shouldn't generalize. He winked. I mean, he knew she hadn't meant it like that. God, I had a knife ready. I had to act rather than think. And I needed him dead so he couldn't jabber at his friends. Want to work now and save the bitchy BS for the AAR? They dragged the heavy corpse as far into the shadows as possible. Then Jim Bui sauntered off the way he'd come. He blended into the crowd as he approached the space between buildings where he'd parted with Daisy. She's not there, his mind shouted in concern. He looked around frantically. A female dressed similarly to the male he'd just slaughtered stood to one side of the street. She glanced around and looked nervously, apparently for her partner. He realized that when the light grew clear enough, the blood from his victim would be very apparent on his arm and his shirt, even though the clothing was dark. He'd been unable to clear off entirely with just the rag in his pocket and a little sand from the ground. Ah, his shirt was still soaked in telltale crimson. It was hard to avoid freezing in place or dashing away like a mad fool, but his training and experience took over in time to replace his gut instincts. He made himself slowly change course toward another area of the plaza, hopefully the same direction Daisy had chosen. He watched the female guard but only with his eyes. He kept his face trained ahead until she was out of sight, and he had to sort through the numerous people who now arrived in droves. Daisy waited anxiously at the entrance to the plaza. Her heart leapt into her throat and she felt the sting and rush of adrenaline when a hand seized her shoulder from behind. She gripped the hand in her own and bent forward and twisted. A man squawked and bent double, his arm locked out uncomfortably and in position for Daisy to break it if she chose to, or shove his face onto the ground. She realized that he was simply one of the people who swiftly entered the space at the edge of the plaza, or he looked terrified and in pain. She quickly apologized in Spanish. I'm so sorry, you startled me. The man stood erect and rubbed at his elbow and wrist, still in some discomfort from the wrenching. His countenance did not indicate forgiveness, but he was also embarrassed at the ease with which this delicate-looking young woman had rendered him helpless. He attempted what he must have thought was a dignified and only slightly offended manner. I merely meant to let you know that you were blocking the pathway for the special sacrifice. He stood and looked at her, awaiting a response. She nodded and walked away from the street entrance, all the while she hoped desperately that Jim Bui would be able to find her in the ever-increasing crowd. The man watched her for a moment, but apparently decided that she wasn't worth his time. She stayed as close as anyone else in the crowd to the path from which Rayner would emerge. Bjorn looked over his shoulder at a slight noise. It was Pearly Gates. Rayner's on the way, but we have a problem. Jim Bui had to kill a dude, and it may have been one of the ceremonial types, dressed all in feathers and leathers and such. Well, I crammed him into a shadowy corner, but when they go looking for him, oh, it's going to raise a hue and cry. Bjorn nodded. It looks like this thing is getting underway very soon. They won't have time to do much until afterwards. He looked at Silvio confidently and raised an eyebrow. Silvio looked thoughtful for a moment, then activated the text feature on the sat phone. Send in the cavalry ASAP. Rain is on the way to be slaughtered. We have no idea where to go once we take her. Plan is still to take her and get inside from the second level. Jim, we had to kill a guard, so we will definitely need extraction. He hit send, and after he read the return message from Art, he relayed it to the other two. We have to get this right. Use the Grand Pooba as a hostage and get Raina into the cliff wall. We don't know what's all in there, but as the boss, he likely has a bolt hole with an emergency exit. Problem will be holding off the mob until we can find it or make him tell us where it is. He fell silent and signaled that the others should as well. There was movement from a doorway at the cliff wall. A tall figure emerged. He was bedecked in a voluminous feathered cloak and wore a massive headdress, complete with a detailed face mask and a jewel-encrusted golden mantle. 
The costume must have weighed a ton, yet the figure walked erect with no audience to behold and began to mount the steps toward the basalt block at the apex of the structure. His back never bent and his head never drooped to check his progress on the shallow steps that literally kept one on his toes. Once he'd attained the summit, Silvio signalled, and the trio swarmed quietly up the pyramid in the wake of the priest-king of this city. Daisy saw a man in an embroidered cotton outfit emerge from the roadway opening. He escorted, not Rayner, but a young man in a plain cotton garment. The young man looked stunned and was obviously fascinated by the structure that rose before him. Daisy was confused for a moment, and then saw the female ceremonial guard step forward and speak quietly to the male patron, the mirror of the matrons who guarded the female dormitory. He looked confused, but eventually nodded, and they escorted the man away from her position. At first she was nervous about following, but the crowd around her shifted and moved along behind the pair that escorted the young man. They walked toward the next entrance to the plaza, where they met with Raina and her escort. Daisy sighed in relief. They had gotten it right that the pair would emerge on the west end of the plaza, closest to the sunrise stairs. It could arguably have gone the other way, but they would climb until they greeted the rising sun at the summit, rather than climb from the east along with those first rays. The matron looked confused for a moment when she saw the barely adorned male figure, but quickly gained her composure and passed off her charge to the pair of escorts. There was Rayner, looking a bit stoned and glassy-eyed. Probably for the best, Daisy thought. It'd be hard enough to get her to go along when the action broke. The girl would normally want an explanation and have her ass smooched. Well, this way maybe she'd shut the fuck up and cooperate. As the escorts took Raina and her new boyfriend in tow, Daisy saw Jim Wee on the other side of the street from which the sacrificial party had emerged. She waved slightly, unsure of protocol for the observers in the crowd. He spotted her and grinned. They soon followed the couple of sacrificial lambs and their shepherds as closely as they dared. Jim walked beside her, with his blood-soaked sleeve between them. Daisy knew that this was not the time to ask about it. At a certain distance from the base of the pyramid, the crowd came to a disturbingly quiet halt. Rayner and the young man continued to stare ahead blankly as they began the climb towards their doom. Bjorn looked up from his perch near the apex of the pyramid. Pearly Gates was just above and peered over the rim at the activities, all out of sight from all but the most observant. She was the most experienced climber and assumed the responsibility of peering over the top edge to determine what was happening. The noise from the crowded plaza had increased, a rumble of many voices and feet that slowly resolved into a rhythmic wave of sound. The priest king waited patiently and eventually feathers appeared as the headdresses of the final escorts appeared before four faces emerged. Rayner was one of the four. The morning sky grew brighter by the second, and the sun had begun to crest the horizon. The sky was blood red, and a bank of red-lipped feathery clouds wound around the eastern sky like an enormous serpent flying toward them. Daisy and Jim Bui made their way around the eastern side of the structure, They hurried as best they could without drawing attention. They had to weave in and out among the chanting, dancing, enraptured crowd. Fortunately, most of the people were absorbed in the religious ecstasy that ensued when humans were sacrificed. It was significant to the psychology of their species. The goal was the second level on the north side. It was their duty to secure the door into the cliff wall. As they reached the base where the pyramid joined the cliff wall, the chanting and dancing ceased. They could hear a deep, loud voice speaking from high above. Come on, Daisy beckoned as they began their ascent. We need to pick up the pace. The rest of the team will be coming down soon. Moctezuma approached the young bride and began to raise the large obsidian dagger. He would plunge it into the girl's upper abdomen. It would sever her diaphragm to prevent her from screaming. And he would cut upward until he had a large enough incision to reach in and pluck out her still-beating heart. When he reached the apex of his slow and dramatic upswing, he was surprised by a pair of hands that locked over his own and pulled him backwards and off balance. 
He heard a strange clacking noise and saw blood and bone spray from the heads of each of the final escorts who were his assistants. As their corpses slumped to the ground, dark figures rushed by on either side of him. The large hands that grasped his own quickly wrapped a strong binding around his wrists. He did not resist. He went limp. Surely this was all part of the divine plan, though he didn't understand. He'd been taken hostage, as his distant ancestor had by the soldados of the Cortez. Sunlight burst over the last barrier and brilliantly lit the altar. Yet the priest king was nowhere in sight. The sacrifices were not on the altar block. Lumps of bloody feathers attached to crumpled bodies lay on each side of the summit. The crowd had been chanting their crescendo, most with their eyes closed in anticipation of opening them to the spray of blood from the sacrifices at the moment of his Pricotli sent the first full rays of the sun. There was silence for a moment, then rumbles and then roars. Something had gone dreadfully wrong. The brightly costumed escorts on each level looked at one another in confusion and then, almost as one, they leapt up the stairs towards the summit. The crowd milled and awaited direction as a growing number of outraged voices rose first in fear, then in anger. A couple of figures who detained the apex of the great structure waved for the crowd to move forward. A voice boomed over the plaza. Come, the cliffs, they have Moctezuma. Bjorn had expected the priest king to resist, and he planned to knock him unconscious and carry him. When he seized the man, He'd torn off the heavy mask and been prepared to slam his elbow into his chin. Yet the man simply smiled beatifically up at him and then, very cooperatively descended the stairs while clutched closely to the young man's side. The stairs were steep, but they made good time. Burley Gates followed, Raina draped over her shoulders, and Silvio carried the young man. The male sacrifice was of no known value, but they hadn't wanted to leave him to the mercies of the priest guards, and by taking them both, they hoped to spread confusion. They made it all the way down to the second level before a hoarse voice shouted from above. Pearly Gates grunted, It's on! And they raced across to the doorway. Bjorn paused for the briefest moment when he saw Daisy and Jim Bui reveal themselves from just inside the entrance. Daisy waved them onward. When they arrived, Jim Bui gave a silent gesture and they followed him into the corridor that bore into the cliff face. The others ran by and Daisy took up rear guard. There was no door to close behind them. Jim led them to a set of stairs and took the downward path. The others simply followed. There hadn't been time to explore, but this way should lead to the ground level and an exit. Upwards would logically lead to living or working quarters and legitimate residents of the city. Bjorn soon saw that the smile on the priest king's face had broadened into a large grin. That was when he and the others realized that they'd already descended past where the first level should have held an exit. He had the sinking feeling that the toothy smile meant something bad for the DMTS field team. He signaled a halt. Our insurance policy is far too happy about the direction we've chosen. Perhaps we should uh, reverse course. He noted that Pearly Gates and Silvio, while both in good shape, had started to pant and sweat with the exertion under their burden. Maybe we should trade off on carrying the victims, or maybe we can get them on their feet. It turned out that both of the intended victims were able to stand and were very compliant. However, the pause meant that the people above had time to react, and they heard the rush of feet and the cries of rage from above. With no better choice, they continued their descent. Moctezuma was thrilled. He discerned the purpose. The gods wanted to feast directly on still living hearts. The young man who so resembled the depictions of the Ketsa, Virochoksha, and other Mesoamerican gog figures from myth and legend was the perfect escort. He was close enough to the description of the Cortes. <gasps> yes, time to move forward. He was ecstatic. All things must come to an end, even downward stairs. These hadn't continued much farther than the point at which the team had paused to shift burdens and decide on plans. The stairs had been fairly standard, but the corridor they entered at the bottom that led back under the pyramid was enormous. 
Bjorn noted that the lights had grown dimmer as they'd gone deeper below the plaza level. The last several had given off a dull yellowish glow, and now the bulbs had switched to orange. It was like descending into the flames of a hot fire that burned various colours. Soon the bulbs gave off a harsh red glow, but even in the gloom he saw that they'd reached a dead end. An enormous stone gate blocked their pathway. Daisy spoke up from her rear guard position. Guys, the mob hasn't rushed down to follow us, but I've heard the pitter-patter of several sets of bare feet on the stairs behind us, along with louder than intended whispers. Maybe those priest guards it didn't sound like the whole mob. The team assembled and crowded the priest king and the two erstwhile sacrifices together. Jim Bui and Bjorn took up positions on either side of the group in the generously wide corridor. It was broad and tall enough for an elephant and a giraffe to walk through side by side without scraping the walls or ceiling. Now that they'd paused and his eyes had adjusted, Bjorn saw that the wall beside the foot of the stairs they had turned down had an outline. It was another gate, as large as the stone that blocked their way. He looked backward toward the dead end. If they could find a way to open either portal, they might be able to escape. He saw that the priest king followed his darting glances between the two potential exits. The man displayed his teeth in a ferocious grin and nodded in what Bjorn interpreted as approval. Weird, this dude is odd. His attention was drawn back to the direction from which they come when Silvio spoke. Here they come. Firearms first, and if there are more bodies than bullets, cold steel, yes? The members of the team all growled in consent to the standard fight plan. On my first round, Silvio spoke in his smooth tones as he took aim. A good forty figures had trundled down the stairs in their wake. All of them appeared to be dressed in feathered ceremonial garments. Beyond considered, perhaps only the priestly class is allowed in this area below the pyramid. Oh, as long as we don't have to face everybody who is in the plaza. Silvio, Daisy, and Pearly Gates took positions toward the center of the corridor. The spread was tactically sound, and when Silvio signaled, the entire team sunk to the ground. Bjorn placed the priest king down on the floor so that any projectiles might pass overhead. Jim Bui managed to get Reyna to follow suit, though the young man just stood and peered vacantly toward the dead end, his back to the oncoming threat. Oh, too late to worry about it. Silvio's weapon thumped clacked through the sound suppressor and the others immediately followed suit. The feather-bedecked warrior priests rushed forward toward the team in earnest. Several flung javelins and the loud cracks of handguns issued from several more. Five of the figures had crumpled immediately and another five were in the process of doing so when Bjorn heard his captive shout and then saw and felt him rise. His vision had been diminished with the flashes from the firearms barrels the gloom had deepened, but he quickly rose alongside the man in case he intended to make a break for the others. Instead, he threw up his bound wrists, palms outward, and continued to shout for a moment. The onrush halted almost immediately. He jabber-chattered for a moment in the consonant-heavy language that none of the DMTS team could follow. One of the warrior priests asked a question in the same language. Their leader spoke from beside Bjorn, calmly and with absolute authority. The group turned, a few paused to help a couple of wounded members of their band, and they all walked back towards the stairs and began to climb. The DMTS members looked at one another, and eventually Silvio spoke. Weird is what we do. Anyone hit? The team members each responded in turn that they were fine, though Pearly Gates added something about, no blood, just brown in my britches. Silvio smiled in his best vulpine manner. Good shooting. Glad we didn't have to kill them all. <clears throat> he grimaced as he noted that the male sacrifice victim stood calmly, as blood leaked from a wound at the top of his right shoulder. It had struck bone and should have had him curled on the floor and squalling in agony. He just stood and stared at the stone gateway ahead. Gateway? No longer a closed gate. Bjorn shouted in his mind. He realized with a shock that his captive had quietly walked over to one side of the corridor and activated a lever that apparently opened the enormous portal. The gargantuan stone smoothly slid to one side and into the wall. 
Beyond, the light shifted from red down to blue, the colour that represented the hottest part of a fire. An overwhelmingly foul stench flooded into the corridor. He realised that it had impinged on his senses earlier, but hadn't been important enough to fully register with all of the other events. He'd just come up with a What I Learned entry for his field training notes. He looked over at his prisoner, who stood calmly and indicated with an open hand that they should enter the gateway. Like Sharon inviting us into the underworld, he thought. Wait a minute, how had he slipped his bonds? Then he noticed the stone dagger in the man's opposite hand. When the priest king saw Bjorn glance at his weapon, he reversed it and offered it to the young giant, his wicked happy smile back in place. Bjorn took the dagger, and this time, without taking his eyes from his charge, asked, So, do we go with him, or chance to climb back up the stairs? Guns up, forward at a cautious pace. Daisy, please resume rear guard unless you need a break, Silvio intoned. Daisy, sounding more perky than most would in this situation, responded, Got it. Easier than creeping forward into the dark. The stench grew stronger as they made their way forward, and an odd sound began to issue from the near absolute dark ahead. Breathing, Bjorn thought as he fished his flashlight out from his equipment vest. Unlikely just restricted airflow in the stone ahead. Oh, Pearly Gate said that the pyramid sounded like it was breathing. Two other beams stabbed through the distance ahead before he had time to activate his own. Twin blazes of lights, like torches, reflected in response, and a thumping rush of enormous feet pounded toward them as the glowing blazes resolved into a pair of eyes in a colossal and hideous countenance. Before anyone could react, a rock the size of a large beach ball whistled through the group and splashed into Daisy. It travelled so swiftly that when it tore through her head and upper body, it left her lifeless body to stumble forward a step before it sunk to the floor of the corridor. It was immediately followed by a rapidly spinning chunk of wood that splattered the torso of the male captive and left his remains smeared and streaked on the wall and floor. The freight train of monster was then upon them in person. It snatched up Jimbui in its six-fingered hand and started to raise him towards its double rows of teeth. The lean man drove his large knife into the hand repeatedly and into the lip of the beast just below its nose. Yet nothing could halt its foul intent and blood fountain from his shoulders as he bit off his head. Silvio shouted, The eyes! Aim at the eyes! It all happened quickly. Pearly Gates flew into a rage. Her features distorted, her teeth gnashed, and she whirled forward, pistol in one hand and knife in the other. Bjorn recognized the transformation as he assumed his own. The berserker soon joined the she-cat as their natures shifted. The intense training he'd endured to channel his rage episodes from mindless fury to an effective last-dish fighting method served Bjorn well. He roared in fury and Pearly Gate shrieked in rage and anguish. Their firearms were quickly emptied and abandoned as they joined the enemy with cold, sharp steel, the human equivalent of teeth and claws. Silvio hammered away with his pistol and followed his own advice. The giant humanoid figure rose to its full and impossible seventeen feet height and flung Jim Bui's remains like a spear of flesh and bone. Silvio instinctively ducked and stepped to one side, though there was no need. The intended target was the feathered cloak that swirled as its owner retreated back down the corridor toward the lever control for the portal. The body smashed together with a wet crunch, and yet another splash sent blood flowing. Ark shook his head in grief and disbelief. I can't believe it. My team wiped out in seconds after all we've been through. I should have been there with you. I should... <laughs> he choked and trailed off. We needed you to be where you were. If you hadn't brought down the cleaner team, we would never have survived that thing. He looked at his wounded but conscious and now bandaged trainee. Bjorn and Pearly Gates were... Amazing... I knew about them and their episodes, but had never witnessed one. And then two at once? Oh, they moved so swiftly I could barely follow the action. Roaring, screeching, slashing, gnashing their teeth. It was terrible and glorious. Pearly Gay slashed the creature's groin and Bjorn. No kazata, no bullshit. He climbed that thing. 
used his short sword and that obsidian knife like pittance, plunged them into the torso over and over until he reached the neck. Oh, too bad about Pearly Gates. About that same time, the Etting kicked her. She flew into the wall, many broken bones, some protruding through her skin, and she still tried to crawl back to the fight. The Cyclopean fell back, though, onto its backside. Bjorn rode it down and plunged that stone blade into its eye. A true Cyclops for the cleaners to capture. He continued to look in admiration at Bjorn, who shrugged. I rarely remember anything after the episodes. Ah, the training helped tremendously. In fact, I want to call Brain and thank him. If he hadn't forced me to learn even as much control as I have, I wouldn't have been able to direct my strikes. I'd have just punched and clawed and bitten like an animal. Like a bear. So, mission accomplished. We got Raina back to her mother. What do you think the US government will do about the Arstalan sites? Bjorn questioned his initial mentor. Brain, a man even larger than he, at the formal debriefing and after-action report. Brain, a name acquired from people constantly juxtaposing the letters of his given name, Brian, shook his head. Probably nothing. They're not anxious to have people realize that slavery still exists in this nation. Granted, this was an aberration of the horror that already existed. They just wanted to feed their pet monster, let's face it. People will follow a religious leader more fanatically than most other kinds. That Moctezuma character wanted to use it as the Ketza, get revenge on those who stole his land. The site's under investigation, the scientific kind. The denizens of the city, well, they've been sent to the loving arms of a rival nation to be hidden among the other cheap labor. Good thing we have the excellent aircraft and night night gas. So, we did all that for nothing. The sex and labor trafficking will continue as always, Bjorn rumpled. That uh, representative doesn't care about anybody but her jerk kids. Brain shrugged. Not our provenance. Governments do what they do, or don't. He made a sour face. Makes me sick too, cub, but this is a big deal. Think what would have happened had Moctezuma led his entire population, plus those of several criminal organizations with ties to him, and the ancient worship to attack the southwest states. A bloodbath of enormous proportions would have ensued. We're hearing rumbles that they may have more of those giants at other sites. I believe we may have to handle more of them in the future. So, what are the things? Nobody else wants to say. They just keep telling me that I may get to know after I complete field training. Apparently, I got more initial training than most. Will I get more field training as well? Does that mean I have to wait for years to know what killed so many of our team? Brain smiled, then laughed a little. We have to do some paperwork and hold a little ceremony, but you've been accelerated from field training status. You'll be a utility player rather than being assigned a single team. Art, Silvio, and Blue Jay have already highly recommended you. As have I, of course, and Ed. You're among a special few to get her endorsement. So, will you accept full-time official employment? Bjorn sat up in surprise, then harumphed in his own deep chuckle. What else is there? Besides light being an international man of mystery, beats being an internet sensation for all the wrong reasons. He ran his thumb along the collar of his sport coat. Besides, I get to dress better. Brain grinned. Excellent. We'll take care of the details, and when you're official, I'll give you the full dossier on what those things are. By the way, your next assignment will be pretty simple. Security for a technological team. There's been a biohazard incident up north. It involves a virus and mutations. Some guy encountered the beasties around some abandoned plant. Ooh, that was a big one for a Monday evening, but, well, as soon as it popped up in my subreddit, Dr. Creeper's Vault, I knew I had to read it. What a fantastic story that was. Hope you enjoyed that one. Now, a um, bit of an accident last night. Um, behind the scenes on YouTube, you can either get to choose where you put your adverts, or you can let YouTube do it for you. And um, <laughs> it's a quite shocking situation of um, 
a gazillion adverts in an hour-long video last night, but um, not my fault. Just a little accident, and it won't happen again, all right? You know how I like to uh, keep the story moving, okay? So, well, that's it. Uh, back again, maybe tomorrow on my other channel, a little story for you. But I'll be back here on Wednesday, and another episode of the podcast coming up on Thursday over on my other channel, and on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere where you care to get your podcast from. So, lots to look forward to this week. But enough for me for one evening. I'm very tired after that. So, till the next time, sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.